Well, th thank you very much for being here. I guess uh, maybe the topic is one that is of interest to, to you. Um, as usual, I, I intend to maybe take about an hour and then we'll have a bit of a break and then uh, we'll uh, come back for questions or discussion if there's any to be and and we'll stop at 8.30, right, at the, at the latest. So th this evening, uh, the question, the way I framed it is, is uh, the Catholic Church the one true church uh, that's that's the way i asked it and ooh, that's loud here we go uh, a bit uh, like this is this okay yes. this okay so so is the catholic church the one true church and, and the reason i chose this topic is um because of a text that came out this uh summer uh, there's a letter that came out from the congregation of the doctrine of the faith now j just to clarify in rome the Pope has a number of bodies that has assist him in his leadership role for the, the church in the world. And uh, the most important of these bodies are called congregations. Uh, it's a funny word for us because when we think of a con at least when I think of a congregation, either I think of a congregation of people at church, you know, the congregation starts singing, or I think of a congregation of religious women or men, you know, like I think of the congregation of the uh, Sisters of the Assumption or something like that, you know, like so a congregation. But in Rome, a congregation, I guess the best way to think about it is more like a ministry at uh, the government or the department, you know. So at the government, you have the Department of Foreign Affairs and you have the Department of Commerce and you have the Department of Indian Affairs and you have the Department of industry you know you have departments right so these congregations are like departments and they have offices and uh, just like in the government you know the uh, the prime minister names the head of each department it's a minister there's the minister of external affairs there's the minister of indian affairs there's the minister of defense in the same way the pope names what they call prefects of various congregations and the prefects are as a general rule cardinals and if they're not cardinals when they're named, they get named cardinal pretty quick. But but usually they're cardinals. So the congregations in Rome, there's a congregation for the sacraments, and there's the congregation for um, Catholic education, and there's the congregation for bishops, and there's the congregation for clergy, and there's the congregation for religious life. Um, there are about a dozen congregations. And there's the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. And each congregation has a special responsibility. And the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith has the responsibility to see to it that uh, the teaching of the church is made clear and that that teaching is taught by the various theologians of the world. So uh, sometimes when an issue comes up and the issue isn't clear, then the congregation will take that issue, talk about it, and then will make a pronunciation, you know? And when the congregation uh, does something like that, usually what they do is before the uh, issuing it, they present it to the Pope, and the Pope signs off on it. So it's not it's not a docu document that has, or... Um, a decree that has the strength of, uh, it's not a papal document, it's, it's a, a document of a congregation, but the Pope has signed off on it, giving it pretty good strength, you know. So the Congregation of the Faith was led up until recently by a cardinal by the name of Joseph Ratzinger who was hoping to retire now that he's turned, he was coming to 80 years old, was hoping to retire, but then got elected Pope, right? And so being elected Pope, one of the first things he had to do was to name a replacement for himself at the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And the person he named was uh, the Bishop of uh, San Francisco, uh, Archbishop Levada, who uh, is... Uh, Cardinal Levada now. And so Cardinal Levada, who's the director, who's the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, he works, you know, on different issues. And this summer they put out this document. And basically the document, what they've done is they've put five questions and they answered each of the questions and the Pope signed off on the answer. And I have the document with me, so I'll be able to give you a copy, so we'll go through the five answers he gave. And the questions turn around. The, que the issue is the Catholic Church, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ. 
the one church of Jesus Christ? That, that's the question. But before answering that, I'd like to go back. I want to give a bit of back history on this, okay? Um, in 1867, what happened in 1867? Canada was formed as a confederation. Very good, 1867. But something happened in the Roman Catholic Church in 1867. It was the beginning of the First Vatican Council. The Pope had called a council in Rome and the bishops went to Rome for this council. And uh, this council, I'm saying 1867, maybe it's 1869. I get these dates mixed up, but around that time, okay? So, so he called this council and uh, there hadn't been a council in the church since 1560 something you know 300 years there hadn't been a council so the pop, pope called a council together and what they wanted to discuss they wanted to discuss um issues dealing with the church and the authority in the church and how the church teaches and so the, the first uh, issue they kind of dealt with was the role of the pope that was kind of one of the first issues they dealt with it wasn't supposed to be the only issue they, they would deal with, but what happened was that um, a war broke out around Rome and the Vatican was attacked. So they stopped the council and everybody went home. And, and so they weren't able to finish the work of the council. So the only, out of, out of the first Vatican council, we have actually two decrees, one on uh, the knowledge of God, and one on the role of the Pope. And that's where they said the Pope teaches, when he teaches in areas of morals and doctrine, he teaches infallibly, you know, ex cathedra teaching. But, uh, but they weren't able to continue the work of the, of the council, and it stopped until John the Twenty Third in 1959, decides to call for another council. And this council would again be held at the Vatican, so it's called the Second Vatican Council, because the first one was in uh, 1867. So, so he, here we are, nearly 100 years later, he calls a council. And one of the main reasons he called the council was to be able to continue the work of the First Vatican Council, which had never been ended, to talk about the church. What, what is the church? Because throughout the history of the church, there had been many, many councils, especially there are about 20 councils, 21 councils in the history of the church. But, but especially at the beginning of the church, in the first few centuries, there were important councils that were called to discuss who is Jesus, you know? Is Jesus truly the Son of God? Is he truly human? Who is the Holy Spirit? Is, does God, Father, Son, and Spirit make three gods, or does it make one God? Is it a trinity of persons and one God? It take, took them a, a long time to work all these issues out. So there were there were these these first seven ecumenical councils that were in the in the first thousand years of the church, and in the second thousand years of the church, especially around the years eleven hundred, twelve hundred, thirteen hundred, there were a number of councils that were called, that were mostly disciplinary in nature. They had to do with the life of the church, but none of the councils had ever asked themselves the question: What is the church? What is the church? And so the Second Vatican Council, which ran from nineteen sixty to 1965 uh, there were there were four sessions of it the, the sessions were held in October and November in 62 and 63 and 64 and in 65 the, the bishops of the world met there were 2,000 bishops at the time they met and they held their sessions right in St. Peter's Basilica and in St. Peter's Basilica they discussed a number of issues and they put out ultimately 16 statements, 16 documents. And where did I leave my book at the back? Did I, did I, leave, did I leave? I had my Bible and, uh, and my book of Vatican documents. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, so this, this is one of the editions of the documents of Vatican II. There are 16 documents that the council produced. And I, I could tell you now that, you know, when before 1960, before 1965, when you went to seminary, the book you, you studied was, um, well, it was a number of books because it's a kind of a library. It was the, the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas, which, which was a work of theology written about 700 years ago. 
and that that had stayed kind of the basic text of to study at seminary when you did theology but i would say now since 1965 the basic text first of all is the bible scripture and then the second basic text is the documents of vatican ii because these documents address some of the fundamental issues of what it means to be Catholic today. And there are two documents in particular. Well, four documents are more important than the other 12. These four documents are called constitutions. They are so important that they, they kind of have a, a superior status. And then the other documents are less important. But of the four documents that are called constitutions, one is on the liturgy. It's from, that, it's from that constitution on the liturgy that was passed in 1962 that all the changes in the liturgy started occurring. So most Catholics, kind of when you say Vatican II, most of the older Catholics, they say, oh yeah, that's what made the Mass go from Latin to English, right? So it's more complicated than that, but the whole reform of the liturgy was started there in 1962 by that document. The second constitution, which is very important, was on the Word of God, on the Bible. That was a very important constitution. That started the whole renewal, scripture renewal, biblical renewal in the Catholic Church. And next year in 2008, the Synod is going to be on the Word of God in the life and in the mission of the Church. So basically, it's going to be going back to that document that was passed in 1964 and take a look at it, how have we grown since then. And then the other two constitutions are on the Church, one on the nature of the Church and the other one on the Church's mission in the world. So the one that's important for us tonight is the first one called on, on the church, the Ecclesia. And all these documents are always quoted by the first two or three words in Latin of the, do, of the text, you know. And so this text starts with the, world, the words lumen gentium, the light of the world. That, so that's, that's the title it's known by. Obviously, the title lumen gentium, the light of the world, does not refer to the church. It is not the church that is the light of the world. Christ is the light of the world. So the, the text starts with the light of the world, Jesus Christ, you know, so it goes on. And then it goes on to speak about the church. And this is the first time that a synod, that, that sorry, a council in the history of the church has ever stopped to think about what is the church in 2,000 years. And so they start talking about what is the church. And I'd like to go to the document then and just outline the major titles in it because it's important to know these things to get the background of the kinds of issues that we're dealing with in the document that was published this summer. And this is why you can't answer these questions in the newspaper because they want a nine-second summary. <laughs> When, when the first document was published, uh, the first, no, no, uh, let me get back. There were a number of drafts that, before they got to a final document, th there were drafts, there were committees that wrote drafts, and then the drafts were discussed, and they were kind of said, okay, let's move on with this draft, or no, let's not, this draft has to be sent over, and we have to restart the whole thing. So the first drafts at the Council of Most of what eventually became these 16 documents were were severely criticized when they br were brought before the bishops. Most of the drafts in 1962, when the bishops got them, they said, this doesn't make sense. No, you can't do this. And that's not the right approach and everything. And so the, the committees that had, start, had written the first drafts were very, very severely criticized. And they had to go back and they had to start over. Many, many of these documents, they had to start over. And the one on the church had started, the first chapter was on the hierarchical nature of the church. That was the first chapter, which meant, which meant that it started by talking about the church as being organized, you know, with, with the pope and the bishops and the religious and, then, and the priests and then the religious and then the lay people, you know, the great pyramid, you know, that we've often thought about uh, as the church, you know? So you've got God, and then you've got the Pope, and then you've got the bishops, and then you've got the priests, and then you've got the religious, and then you've got the lay people, right? Kind of moving down the ladder. And, and that's how they started with the first draft. And the bishops said, no, 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 you can't start that way. 
And, and so there was a lot of argument, a lot of uh, important, when you hid, read the history of the council, you see there were a lot of, well, these are very intelligent and very strong-willed people who, who uh, participate in these things. And ultimately, uh, what happened was that the first chapter was completely rewritten. And the first chapter is called The Mystery of the Church. Isn't that a, you know, going from the hierarchy to the mystery of the church? We start by talking about the church as a mystery. Why do we say the church is a mystery? Because what we're trying to say is the, myst the, the church comes from the will of God. And the church is part of God's plan of salvation for the world. Now, right away, and, and this is where it's really important to understand this, to, to understand the answer that, that we're going to talk about from this summer. You see, a lot of people, when they talk about the church or the churches, they talk about it from a sociological point of view. What do I mean? What I mean is that they're looking at it from kind of a rational, scientific point of view. They're looking at the fact that there are these people who are believers. They share common faith. They share common moral code, they share a common way of practicing their religion, and they come together and they form churches. A bit like people who, you know, they're all fans of a pop singer, they form a fan club. Or, or people who all like to play golf, they, they form a golf club. Well, people who all share the same religion, they form groups and these groups that are formed well the, the jews call them synagogues and and the muslim call them mosques and and the christians call them churches and uh, so you see you're looking at it from a sociological point of view and so you analyze this from a sociological point of view and a lot of people do sociologists and people who are specialists in uh the the theory of religion re religious studies that we call it they look at it as a kind of a human phenomenon, and they study it to see how these churches form, how they kind of break apart, how they endure, how they get distorted, how they bring new members in, how they throw old members out. <laughs> you know, so that's that that's com kind of from an outside point of view. But the the council said no. That's not the right starting point to understand the church. To understand the church, you have to start from God's perspective. You have to st start from how is God's plan of love working out for humanity? And when you say that, then you're talking about a mystery. Because a mystery is a reality that is so huge that we'll, we'll never get our minds wrapped around it. What we need to do is kind of poke at it, <laughs> understand it. And, and when you're looking at a mystery, each approach to that mystery is one approach only. No approach can... can you know, say everything. So we kind of look at the church this way and we look at the church that way and we look at the church trying to see it from this point of view and from that point of view, but realizing that the church is rooted in God's plan of love for, for humanity. See, because God, God started by, you know, uh, revealing God's self to a people, the Jewish people. And, and God trained that people in understanding and in opening themselves up to the work of the Spirit so that e eventually God was able to be incarnate in Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of the world. And Jesus' work then doesn't stop there. But then Jesus gives to his apostles a command you know, uh, he takes bread and wine. This is my body. This is my blood. Do this in memory of me. He gives them that command. He gives them an, another command. Uh, go, baptize all people. Teach them everything I, I've taught you. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I will be with you. He gives them commands, but Jesus also gives them a spirit, his spirit the Holy Spirit that comes in and rests upon them and, and, and becomes a strength and the power within them to go then and to do that. And out of that springs forth the church. And, and so that church is part of God's plan, just as much as this, the history of Israel is part of God's plan, just as much the life of Jesus is part of God's plan. The church, 
that grows out of that is also part of God's plan. All of that is part of the great mystery of God working a plan of salvation in the midst of the world. So the church is not just a kind of a club or, or, or an association. It's not just a sociological reality. It's part of God's vision for the world. So that's why they started by speaking about the mystery of the church. And in, in speaking of that mystery, well, they say everything that I've just said, but they say it in much nicer language. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so they, they speak about the different words that are used in the Old Testament and in, in the New Testament to speak about the church, how, how the church is, is like a sheepfold that has one shepherd, how, how the church is like a piece of land to be cult cultivated, the field of God. That's one of, Paul says that. Paul is speaking about how the church is the field of God that needs to be worked and cultivated. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the Holy, is the temple of the Spirit. The church is the people of God. See, all of those, th those are metaphors. How they're symbols. It's all symbolic language trying to get to the heart of what the church as a mystery is. So they go on about that. And then the second chapter is they choose one of those images and they speak about, and this is the second chapter, the people of God. The church is the people of God. And in that people then, they go on to speak about the third chapter within that people. There's, excuse me when I get to it, the hierarchy, the hierarchical structure of the church with special reference to the episcopate, to the bishops. So you see how we've gone from a text that starts with the hierarchy and instead we start with the mystery and then we go to the people of God. And why did they choose that image of the people of God? Because one of the things they wanted to bring out was that through baptism we are all, and confirmation, we all become full members of the church. We, we, are, we enter into the life of the church and so all of us are are share in the life of the church and in the mission of the church and the responsibility of the church. It was very important to say that because for a lot of people back then, when you said the church, they thought about the pope and the bishops and the priests. That's the church, you know, that's the church. And, and the rest, the lay people, baptized, confirmed, aren't really the church. And I tell this story often when I give uh, retreats. I speak about when I was a kid, my, my parents bought the Golden Book Encyclopedia. And in the Golden Book Encyclopedia, I went to see Catholic Church. And what's, what was neat about the Golden Book Encyclopedia was there were illustrations. That's what I liked about it, huh? And so when I opened it up to the Catholic Church, what did I see? I saw a drawing of the Pope and of a Cardinal and of a Bishop and of a priest. And that was it. See, and so, so you see how that, the Church was those people. The clergy was the church. And so the Second Vatican Council ha you know, had to kind of readjust that and say, no, the church is all the baptized, the confirmed. That is the church. Within the church, there will be a structure of leadership. That's the hierarchy, a service of leadership. We'll get to that. But first of all, we have to talk about the people of God, right? So the church is a mystery, the church is a people of God, and then and then the hierarchy. And then it'll go on to speak about the lay people and speak about the religious and it'll speak about the universal call to, to holiness of all the people of God and it will speak about Mary as the mother of the church. So that's the whole constitution on the church there wrapped up into a nutshell. In the second chapter when it speaks about the people of God we come to number eight. You know, my contacts aren't working well tonight. Let me try to see if I can read this. Eight. Okay. Christ, the one mediator, established and ceaselessly sustains here on earth his holy church, the community of faith, hope, and charity as a visible structure. So who is the founder of the church? Christ. And who sustains the church? Christ. So Christ is the founder, but he's also the sustainer of the church. So, so G Christ didn't just found the church, but he sustains the church. And he founded it as a visible structure. Through the church, 
Christ communicates truth and grace to all. But the society furnished with hierarchical agencies and the mystical body of Christ are not to be considered as two realities. See, he's saying the visible structure of the church and the mystery of the church are not to be considered as two realities because some people talk this way. There's kind of the mystical body of Christ, you know, the, 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 the mystery of the church. And then there's the social structure. And those are two things. No, 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 they say. You can't see them as two different things. Nor are they... Um, nor are they the visible assembly and the spiritual community. You know, as if you can separate those two. Nor the earthly church and the church enriched with heavenly things. You, you, can't, you can't kind of separate the visible church from the mystery of the church that God wants. Rather, the, the text goes on, they form one interlocked reality which comprises a divine and a human element. And so they say, here's the analogy, here's the example. The example is the mystery of Jesus himself. Just as the eternal word assumed nature inseparately united so, and serves him as the living instrument, so in a similar way does the communal structure of the church serve Christ's spirit who makes it alive, building up the body. So what they're saying here is that in the same way that in Jesus we find two natures, the divine nature and the human nature, right? Jesus is both God and man. In the church, there's a divine dimension and a human dimension, all right? They're not separated. It is the same reality, but there are two dimensions to it. It really is a mystery, right? You know that great sentence before, before, the, before communion when the priest says, Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, I give you my peace. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Huh? Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. This little prayer kind of speaks about those two realities. At a human level, at a visible level, you know, we are all sinners, and the church is made up of sinners. But at the level of God, at the level of the mystery, the church is holy. <laughs> the church is holy. And that's why we say, I believe in one Catholic, apostolic, one holy, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The church is one, it is holy. It's not holy because the members are all holy. It's holy because it, it is rooted in God and springs from God, and God is holy. You see? So inasmuch as we, as a church, we are rooted in God, we are holy. But inasmuch as we are all fragile, vulnerable human beings, then we are sinners. It's not the church that is sinful, the church is holy. But the members of the church are sinful. And so... And so what we're saying here is that there's a kind of distinction between there's a distinction between the divine rootedness and the human reality, but that distinction does not separate so that there are two churches, a kind of a, a divine church and a human church. It's the one church that has two dimensions. Now, as I said, we believe this is a mystery, so it's hard to explain. You know, it's an approach. It's a, trying to understand this. And so even the language of the council is a symbolic language, is a metaphorical language, but we're trying to say this. And then it goes on. This is the unique church of Christ, which in the creed we avow as one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. So the church is one, holy, Catholic. It's the unique church of Christ. God, God did not plan to have many churches God has one church. In God's plan, there is one people of God. You know that, that beautiful uh, saying at the end of the book of Revelations? The bride and the spirit say, come, Lord Jesus. Huh? Do you know that sentence? The bride and the spirit say, come. Who is the bride? The bride is the church. So God doesn't want many brides. <laughs> God isn't a poly polygamist. God wants one bride. That God's plan, God's vision is one bride. So the church is one. 
It is one people of God. And it is through that people that God reaches out and touches the world because that one church is the sacrament of salvation for the whole world. This one church is the body of Christ. God doesn't have, Christ doesn't have many bodies. One body, one head. So that unity is essential. After his resurrection, our Savior handed over the church to Peter to be shepherded. You know that, that famous line where he says, Peter, do you love me? And, 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 and Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Well, then take care of my sheep. So Jesus entrusted to Peter the care of that church, commissioning him and the other apostles to propagate and govern her. Go, make disciples. He erected her for all ages as the pillar and the mainstay of the truth. This church, and this is the important sense here, this church constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic Church. And I, I want you to hold on to the, the, this little sentence because this is the heart of the controversy. This church, constituted and organized in the world as a visible society, subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in union with that successor. Although, although, Many elements of sanctification and of truth can be found outside her visible structure. This sentence is, is key here. So it says, this church, the church that God wants, the one bride of Christ, that church subsists in the Catholic Church, although many elements of sanctification, what does it say? Many elements of sanctification and truth can be found outside her visible structure. These elements, however, as gifts properly belonging to the Church of Christ, possess an inner, inner dynamism towards Catholic unity. So the elements of, of truth and of sanctification which are not in the Catholic Church, which can be found, basically they're going to explain this later on, which can be found in Protestant denominations in the Anglican Church and Orthodox Communicate, those elements of sanctification which can be found outside the church, because they belong to the one church of Christ, they, they have an inner dynamism towards that unity that God wants for the church. That's the source of the ecumenical movement. That's the source of the movement that, that strives to bring all of us back into the one fold of Christ, okay? So that sentence, the one church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Now, this sentence was, uh, how can you say, uh, <laughs> a kind of a question mark sentence, a, a surprise question at that time, and still is today, because Pius XII, Pius XII was the Pope in the 1940s and 50s, he had written a document on the church. And in that document, he had said, the Church of Christ is the Catholic Church. The Church of Christ is the Catholic Church. And what the council said, the Catholic Church subsists in. The, the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Why did they change it from is to subsists in? Why did, they, why did they move that? Why, why didn't they keep the word is? And some people understood that to kind of say, well, it subsists in the Catholic Church, but that means it also subsists elsewhere. If you don't say is, which kind of makes it equal, you know, then you say, well, if it subsists here, well, then it can subsist there, and it can subsist there. And so people started saying, some theologians started saying, well, that means what the bishops were saying. What they, what they meant was that the Church of Christ exists in all sorts of churches, not just the Catholic Church. And this is where this document came out, and I'm going to pass it to you now. I've got 50 copies. I really wasn't expecting this many people. So those who are couples, maybe you can take, one and 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 uh, and pass it on, and uh, or if you're with a good friend, maybe take one copy to to pass it around. Th 
So the, the first question that was asked, so the, like I said, there are five questions, they respond to the five questions, right? So the first question that was asked, did the Second Vatican Council change the Catholic doctrine on the church? Because some people are saying that. Because we went from the Church of Christ is the Catholic Church to the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, they're saying, well, did they change the teaching? And so the Congregation of the Faith answers, the Second Vatican Council neither changed nor intended to change this doctrine. Rather, it developed, deepened, and more fully explained it. And this answer is absolutely right. You know, when you go and study the record, when you look at the discussions that the bishops had, because all the discussions the bishops had are on record, huh? the, the Second Vatican Council, big, big books, you know, with all the, all the discussions, all the acta, they call them. And you go read it, you see that there's not one bishop who wanted to change the teaching of Pius XII. They weren't saying, oh, Pius XII was wrong to say the Church of Christ is the Catholic Church. Nobody said that. Nobody hinted at that. So it's clear that the council was not seeking to change the teaching of the church on the church's identity. This was exactly, uh, but rather it developed and deepened and more fully explained it. This was exactly what John the Twenty Third said at the beginning of the council. And Paul VI affirmed it. And he commented in the act of promulgating the constitution, Lumen Gentium. He said, there is no better comment to make than to say, that this promulgation really changes nothing of the traditional doctrine. What Christ willed, we also will. What was, still is. What the church has taught down through the centuries, we also teach. In simple terms, that which was assumed is now explicit. That which was uncertain is now clarified. That which was meditated upon, discussed, and sometimes argued over is now put together in one clear formulation. The bishops repeatedly expressed and fulfilled this intention. So, first question. Was the council trying to change the teaching on the church? Answer, no. It was trying to explain it better. Okay. Second question. What is the meaning of the affirmation that the church of Christ subsists in the Catholic church? The response. Christ established here on earth only one church. Like I said, Christ doesn't want many brides. He wants one bride. And he instituted it as a visible and spiritual community that from its beginning and throughout the centuries has always existed and will always exist and which alone are found all the elements that Christ himself has instituted. This one church of Christ, which we confess in the creed as one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And here he's quoting directly, they're quoting directly from the constitution of the church. This church, constituted and organized in this world as a society, subsists in the Catholic church, governed by the successor of Peter and the bishops. In number eight of the dogmatic constitution, subsistence means this perduring historical continuity and the permanence of all the elements instituted by Christ in the Catholic church, in which the church of Christ is concretely found on this earth. What, what are they saying here? They're, they're saying that basically when, when Christ founded the church, when the first apostles went out and preached, the church was, was, was the church. There was only one church. When they went out and founded, you know, like uh, Paul went uh, all over Greece, huh? Ephesus and Corinth and everything, and he was founding churches, you know, communities of faith. He wasn't founding many churches. This was the one church that could be found here, the church that is at Corinth, the church that is at Athens, the church that is in Ephesus, the church that is in Philippi, the church that is in Rome. He was founding these churches all over the place, but they were the one church. That one church has always existed, it has perdured. Some people said that when, for example, the East and the West, the church broke into two huge branches, the East and the West, those that were kind of recognized the authority of the Pope in Rome and those that gathered around the leadership of the bishops that were in communion with the patriarch of Constantinople in what is now Turkey. It, see, the Roman Empire at one point split into two. In the East, the Latin 
in the West and, and the Greek in the East. This happened in the 4th and the 5th and the 6th centuries. And, and in the 11th century, the church, well, those two halves kind of excommunicated each other, you know, and they split. And, and so some people said from that split onward, the church of Christ stopped existing. You know, and then in the West, the Protestant Reformation started all sorts of other churches, the Anglican Church, the Lutheran Church, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, all those other churches. So some people are saying, well, only when all these churches come back together in unity, then will the, then will the Church of Christ exist on earth again. And, but right now, the Church of Christ doesn't exist on earth. That, that's what some people are saying. Well, this document is saying, no, 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 no. That's not what the bishops were saying. The bishops believe that the Church of Christ has always perjured, has always existed and continues to exist and in the Catholic Church where can be found, and this is the, this is the important part here, where can be found, where does it say, excuse me, um, all the elements of sanctification and truth. All the elements of sanctification and truth. You see, what is it that in, church, in the church, how does Christ through his church lead people to holiness? He does it, Christ does it through the proclamation of the word. He does it through the teaching of the bishops. He does it through the leadership of the Pope. He does it through the sacraments. He does it through the actions of the communities which gather and commit themselves to, to working for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of justice, peace, and joy. All those are elements of salvation. The fullness, all the elements can be found in the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church has never rejected any of those elements of salvation. So that's why they're saying, what they're saying is that to say that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, is that it's in the Catholic Church that you can find all the elements of salvation that Christ wanted to give to his church. Let me take it from another point of view. When the Orthodox and the Catholics split in the 11th century between the East and the West, between the Latins and the Greeks, they split over one issue. Well, they split over a number of issues, but the fundamental issue they split over was the leadership role of the Pope for the whole church. They, they recognized that the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, they recognized that he's special. You know, They said he's the successor of Peter, and Peter was the first among the apostles. So he's the first. But that first, they only recognize it in terms of honor. You know? So he's the most honorable one. So when, when we'll gather, he can sit on the biggest uh, uh, chair. You know? We'll give him the biggest chair. We'll give him the highest crown. He's got the honor. But he's got no authority. <laughs> you know? You got, you got things like that, huh? Honor but no authority. Huh? So it's like a Monsignor in the Catholic Church. You know, Monsignor McDougall, nice guy, nice title, no authority. <laughs> so, so, so what they're saying is that, well, the Pope, yeah, he's the first in honor, but, but not in authority. He has no authority. He has no power to exercise a primacy within the Church. So they rejected that. But... In the Catholic Church, we believe that that primacy of the Pope is one of the elements of sanctification that Christ left to his church, that Christ wants there to be a leader like the Pope in the church, that Christ wants there to be a leader whose task is to keep the unity among all the various local churches. Otherwise, what happens is that the churches will break apart. They'll separate into, into different groups. And unfortunately, right now, we see that. I don't know if you've been following this. It's a very, very sad situation for the Anglican Communion because the Anglican Communion in the world right now is splitting. And one of the reasons it's splitting is because there is no primatial authority. There's, no, there's nobody who has the, pri the, the leadership 
the primacy to be able to kind of call everybody together. They say, well, there's the Archbishop of Canterbury. But the Archbishop of Canterbury is exactly that. He's one bishop among others who has a primacy of honor, but he does not have a primacy of authority. So nobody has the authority to call the churches to order in the Anglican Church, and, and they're facing right now a, a schism, a split over some fundamental issues. So the Catholic Church has always believed that the role of the Pope, the primacy, is one of the elements that God wants for his church to be able to keep that unity, all right? Let me give you another example. When, uh, when Luther separated from the church of Rome uh, and started the Lutheran church, Luther rejected what is called the authority of tradition, which is kind of the, the, the 2,000, well, at that time it was 1,500 years of interpretation of Scripture. He kind of said those 1,500 years of interpretation, they don't have any validity. I'm going to go back and I'm going to interpret Scripture as if those 1,500 years were, had never existed. We'll go back to Scripture, we'll interpret Scripture, and the Spirit will tell us how to interpret it. As if the Spirit had never been leading the interpretation during the 1500 years, you know? So in the church, we believe that the tradition of interpretation is also part of the gifts that God gives, wants for his church. God is leading his church to interpret and to understand, and we can't just kick out the 1500 years as if it has no meaning. But Luther kind of chucked it all and said, we'll go right back to the text. As if the text can be understood without that tradition of interpretation. And then you have somebody like um, Calvin, who started the Calvinist church, the Reformed church, who said, well, there are only two sacraments, and the only two sacraments that, that are spoken of in, in, in uh, the New Testament are uh, communion and baptism, and that's it. So the other, the, other, the other rituals are not sacraments. And the notion of a priesthood is not necessary. Now, now Luther had kept the priesthood and the episcopacy. So the Lutherans still have bishops and priests. But Calvin threw out the whole notion of bishops and priests. We believe that bishops and priests, the structure of bishops and priests and deacons is part of the elements of sanctification that, that Christ has left as a gift to his church, to structure his church so that his church can have this, 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 uh, this effect in people's lives. And, 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 and then you had others who started saying, well, we don't need this, we don't need that. And, and so what we find, we find a lot of elements of sanctification. And, and in all the Protestant churches, we find at least this, the attachment to Scripture, to the Word of God. That's, a, that's an element of sanctification that we find in all the Protestant churches. We also find the love that is a sign of the Spirit acting in their lives. That also is an element of sanctification. We find commitment to following Christ. That's an element of sanctification. We find good preaching. That's an element of sanctification. See, you find elements of sanctification in all these groups. But only in the Catholic Church do you find all the elements that Christ wants for his church. It's only in the Catholic Church that you find them all. You find, you find preaching, and you find the love of the community, and you find the charisms of the Spirit, and you find the word proclaimed, and you find the sacraments, and you find uh, the, the, the role of the bishops, you find the papacy, everything is found in the Catholic Church. So that's what it means to say that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. So, so that is the teaching of the Church. Now, I, I, I want to make a point here. Obviously, <laughs> the Protestant churches won't agree with that. They'll say, well, you're defining the church you want. You know, you're defining the church you the way you want to. You're saying that the church has to have a structure of uh, bishops, popes, and, and deacons. And, and we're saying it doesn't have to. And our response to that is that, well, we recognize that. We don't have the same understanding of church. 
We don't have the same understanding. That's one of the things that's separating us. We don't have the same understanding. What we're saying is the way we understand church in our use of the word, this is what we understand it to mean. And using that criteria, then we can only say that the church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. And outside the Catholic Church, you find elements of salvation, but you don't find the fullness of the means of salvation. Okay? And then they'll say, but we claim the right to call ourselves church. Well, yes. I mean, for sure, you know, we'll still call, you know, the Anglican Church is still the Anglican Church and the, the, the Lutheran Church is still the Lutheran Church. But it's just that in the way we as Catholics understand what the church is, then we say it's, it doesn't correspond to our understanding. That's all we're saying. It doesn't correspond to our understanding of what the church is. And we're going to have to talk some more about what the church is. Those are the ecumenical dialogues that have been going on now for 40 years and will continue to go on. And, uh, and, and so a, a document like this kind of throws the differences in each other's face. Huh? They're saying, we don't understand church the way you do, and it's got pow, it's right there. But and in a sense, you have to do that if you're going to move forward in the dialogue because what's happening is that everybody's using the same words, but they're not understanding the same things. And part of a true dialogue is to make sure that we're understanding the same things. And if we're not, then let's talk about that. Third question. We're coming uh, five minutes and then we'll take a break. Third question. So why was the expression subsists in adapted, adopted instead of the simple word is? Well, the use of the expression, which indicates the full identity of the Church of Christ with the Catholic Church, does not change the doctrine of the Church, as it says. Rather, it comes from and brings out more clearly the fact that there are numerous elements of sanctification and truth which are found outside her structure, but which, as gifts properly belonging to the Church of Christ, impel towards Catholic unity. It follows that these separated churches and communities, though we believe they suffer from defects, are deprived neither of significance nor of importance in the mystery of salvation. In fact, the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as instruments of salvation, whose value derives from that fullness of grace and truth which has been entrusted to the Catholic Church. So what the Council, this is quoting the Council, the Council is saying, and this was the first time, this was the first time that an official document was saying, is that, the people who belong to those other ecclesial communities, the Protestant churches and the Orthodox churches, Christ is saving them through their churches. You know, we're not saying they're all going to hell. It's not at all what we're saying. On the contrary, the document says we recognize. And that's why they use the word subsist, because by saying, using is, it kind of, the danger was to make it so exclusive, you know? The Church of Christ is the Catholic Church. It made it so exclusive that it seemed to say, and outside of the Church, then there's nothing. You know, outside of the Catholic Church, there's nothing of value. But the bishops wanted to say, no, we want to recognize that the Spirit is also acting in those other churches through the preaching of the Word, through conversion, through the love, through the gifts of the Spirit. So we don't want to kind of restrict the action of the Spirit to just what is going on in the Catholic Church. On the contrary. So the word subsists is chosen in order to say that the Church, you know, perjures, the Church of Christ perjures, is present in the Catholic Church, and at the same time, the Spirit continues to work through these other groups also. So that's why they use the word subsists. Fourth question. Why does the Second Vatican Council use the term church in reference to the Oriental churches separated from full communion with the Catholic Church. And the fifth question is, why do the texts of the Council and those of the Magisterium since the Council not use the title of church with regard to those Christian communities born out of the Reformation? So, so here it's a distinction that we use in our language as Catholics. When we speak about the Orthodox, we speak about Orthodox churches, and we use the word church when we speak about the Orthodox. Why? And the answer, I won't read it, but basically is because though they've rejected the role of the Pope, they have kept the apostolic succession of the apostles. They have kept the, the bishops and the priests and the deacons. And so their sacraments, they've kept all the sacraments and those sacraments are fully valid. 
So we recognize the validity of the celebration of Mass and of the orders. You know, when, when I meet a bishop from the, the Orthodox Church, I recognize that he's a bishop as much as I'm a bishop. He's a success, successor of the apostles as much as I am. All right? So the Orthodox have kept nearly all of, of, of the what we would call the elements of salvation, nearly all except the role of the Pope. Okay, So because they've kept it all, when they build a diocese, their diocese is a real diocese, right? So for example, here in Ontario, there's a diocese, Ontario forms the diocese of um, Toronto for the uh, Greek Orthodox Church. Bishop Soterios is bishop of that diocese. So I recognize him as a fellow bishop, and I recognize his diocese as a real diocese. So I can say that the diocese, his diocese, is a sister church to mine, a sister church to the diocese of Alexandria Cornwall, you know? So, so we recognize that these are churches. Their dioceses are dioceses like ours. So we use the word church to speak about the Orthodox because they've kept bishop, priest, deacon, and all the sacraments that are tied with that. They never lost that, okay? We use the word church for them. But the Protestant churches, those that grew out of the Reformation in the 16th century, those that started with Luther and then continued with Calvin and Zwingli and John Knox that gave rise to the Presbyterians and the Anglicans and uh, the, the, the Baptists and the Methodists and the Pentecostal churches and the Evangelical churches, all those churches, all those churches broke off the tradition of, of the ordination of bishops. And, and of priests and of deacons. Some of them have kept structures similar and sometimes they give the same title, but at one point their theology was so far from the understanding of the Catholic Church that we can't say that their intention when they were ordaining bishops or priests was the same as we understand it. So, so they've moved away from that. They, they broke the apostolic succession in our estimation. They broke that. A lot of them rejected it completely. The Presbyterian Church is called Presbyterian. Why? Because they're saying we have no bishops, we only have priests. And the adjective for priest is Presbyterian. Actually, they don't have priests. They went back to the old word, which was elder, presbyteros in Greek. So they have elders. They rejected the notion of bishops and priests. And, and, you know, Pentecostal churches and evangelical churches, they don't want to hear anything about having bishops and priests. And they, they see that as the work of the Antichrist, some of them, you know. So, so obviously they've broken off from that tradition that was handed down from bishop to bishop to bishop. Because of that, we do not use the word church in our official documents to speak about them. We use the word ecclesial communities, church-like communities, because they have elements of salvation. We recognize that the Spirit is working through them, but they don't have the fullness of the means which can be found in the Catholic Church. And I want to end this little part just by saying this, that... And, and, and you can read, but that's, that's what it says in the fourth and the fifth questions. That to say that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church is not a claim of arrogance that we are better than you. It has nothing to do with that, you know? <laughs> it, it, and it certainly doesn't mean that we're holier than you. Uh, there are a lot of Pentecostals and uh, Evangelicals that are holier than a lot of Catholics, all right? It has nothing to do with an evaluation of the holiness of the people who belong to these various groups. All it is is a recognition that what God wants for his church is the fullness of means of salvation. And the fullness of means of salvation, historically, is found and it subsists in the Catholic Church. Jesus once said, to whom much is given, much will be demanded. And in a sense, to belong to this church then is a privilege and a duty to live up to the call to holiness which is set upon us. If we have the fullness of the, of the means of salvation, of sanctification, then we should be using them. <laughs> 
and, and not to, in a sense, makes us more guilty than people that don't have access to the fullness of means of salvation and, and are doing a pretty good job. So this document give, cannot give rise to arrogance or to superiority, but to humility and to pushing us towards working even more that one day all those who bear the name Christian will find themselves in the one church of Christ. All right? So that was the little comment I wanted to make. Before we take a five-minute break, there's coffee at the back, hot water for those who want to make tea, and we'll come back in five minutes, okay? Thank you. The floor is open. Yeah. Uh, we've learned from the start, as I was growing up, that the church, the Catholic church, is the one true church. But then when you come to say that God revealed himself in many ways, does that eliminate, uh, does that therefore include, in the very beginning, does, would you say that the Muslim faith is a revelation from God or the Sikhs or those different religions? Yeah, so you're, you're bringing the question of the status of other religions, huh? because when we speak about uh, the, the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, we're obviously, here we're discussing fundamentally, I mean, deep down, the, the relationship of the Catholic Church vis-a-vis -vis the other Christian communities. Huh? But you're asking, well, outside of Christianity, how do we see the other religions? And, and so that's an issue that was also discussed uh, at the Second Vatican Council. And, um, and again, here the, 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 the Council stated in the same way that the Council stated that we recognize that the Spirit uses elements of sanctification in uh, other ecclesial communities and in our sister orthodox churches in the same way we the the second vatican council said we we recognize that people of goodwill can be saved outside of the christian church and that um and and we recognize many good qualities in those other religious groups all right so uh for example particularly the jewish people we, we consider that the first covenant, the covenant that God established with the Jewish people, was not abrogated, was not ended with the coming of Christ. That covenant, the Jewish people remain the chosen people of God, you know? And so, and so certainly God acted through the history of the Jewish people and, and continues to act through their history, all right? So, so we say that about the Jewish people. Um, the Muslims share with us the belief in one God, one personal God. And in that sense, they, they share in some of the truth. But we do not say that Catholics do not see uh, the teachings of the Quran as being revealed teachings. The way we see the teachings of the Hebrew scriptures, we believe they are revealed teachings. Um, the, we s revealed in the sense that the, that the teachings of the Hebrew, the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, Part, that's part of God's plan to teach the world uh, about himself. Um, but the Catholic Church would see uh, the writings of uh, Muhammad more as private writings of his, you know, uh, in which there is truth, but not necessarily always, you know, and so they would need to be evaluated vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our teachings. So, so the way we would see uh, the Muslim religion, it, we would see it uh, uh, officially from a Catholic point of view, would see it as uh, people that are striving to, to go to God, and in as much as they are um, honest and right-minded in, in their search, God recognizes that church and, and uh, that search, and God blesses that search, and, and they also can be saved. You know? But the question is, are they saved because they are Muslims? <laughs> and, and, and that question uh, has not been answered in the Catholic Church. We say they are saved, those who are saved, anybody who is saved is saved because of Jesus Christ. Even if they do not know it, they are saved because of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the Savior of all humanity. You know? Um, and then we would say, well, for the for the Oriental religions, Buddhism and Taoism and uh, Shintoism, we recognize at least their search for the spiritual as being good 
and is being uh, uh, you know blessed by God. You know, so so what we see in the other religions, we see goodness in the other religions. All right, we see goodness, but we believe that those who are saved are saved by Jesus Christ, even in those other religions. Okay, does that help a bit? We would we it's the same spirit. The spirit is active, the spirit blows where the spirit wills, you know. But it is always the spirit of Jesus Christ. You know, it is the spirit that is that was given that was given in Jesus Christ. That spirit can touch many hearts. All right. And so inasmuch as those people remain open to the spirit, even if they do not know that it is the spirit of Christ, then we, we recognize that they can be saved. Yeah. Which is a very different position, say, than the evangelical churches who would say that if you do not know Jesus and claim him as your savior, then you are damned. You know, so that's that's another, you know, when we say we don't agree on the definition of church, we, we don't even agree on, on things like that with, with some of our Christian brothers and sisters. Um, yes, and then you, yes. The spirit of the Old Testament, uh, would you say that's the spirit of Jesus? Yes, it is the spirit of Jesus acting in, because the, the, the spirit is always the spirit of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. You know, so the spirit is the bond between the father and the son, and the son was incarnate in Jesus. So it's always the spirit of Jesus that the. the sp so they didn't know what it. Even if they didn't know it, uh, it was still the spirit of Jesus who was preparing, in a sense, the coming of Jesus and preparing the the minds of people and the tradition to be able to receive Jesus when he came into the world. So there's no spirit of God the Father. Like yeah, well, the, yes, it is the spirit of the Father and the Son. We say it's the spirit of the Father and the Son together. Uh, the Orthodox would put more emphasis on it is the spirit of the Father. <laughs> you know, they, they, the, the, the Orthodox in their tradition put a greater emphasis on the fact that the source of the, the Son's being and of the Spirit's being is the Father. The Father is the source from which, the, the, from all eternity, the, the, the Spirit and um, the... Uh, the sun both exist, you know, are. But uh, in, in, in the Latin tradition, we kind of speak of the spirit as coming from both the father and the, and the son. That's another topic that's been studied. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was an important document that came out in the dialogue with the Orthodox, because that was one of the reasons that, that we split also, was an understanding of the Trinity. And uh, today we say that we might, speak of it with different language but we understand it the same way so it's no longer considered a an obstacle to unity with the orthodox yeah yes um it says uh well whatever it says in the instruments of salvation that um no matter how they're being basically they're trying to save everybody in their own teachings their own ways. yes where do we draw the line between sex and the ecumenical where do we draw the line? Who's in what camp? What's a sect and what's... Oh, a, oh sex. S-E-C-T-S. <laughs> <laughs> what is an ecclesial community and what is a sect? Yes, yeah. The, that line is very hard to draw, I think. It's hard to say this is an ecclesial community and this is a sect. Um, most people would say what is typical of a sect is the um, the focus on one person, the, 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 the leader of the sect. The focus is so strong on that person that the sect doesn't even survive that person's death. Or if it does, because it worships practically, it venerates that, that person. So it's the focus on the one person to the exclusion of everything else is kind of characteristic of a sect. The other, the other characteristic of a sect is the, is the sect's belief that um, outside of the sect there, there, there's only darkness, you know, that light is here but nowhere else. That also is kind of a characteristic of a sect. Uh, but then, you know, some people say that the Christian church started as a sect within uh, Judaism because we were all focused on Jesus, you know, so the focus on the one leader. So that's why it's hard to say what is a sect and what is not. Usually when we say of an ecclesial community, we're judging them positively. When we say it's a sect, we're kind of judging them negatively, right? I think uh, for us in the Catholic tradition, one of the things that is important is to keep your brain working. 
that you're using your reason as you're studying uh, the, the teachings of a group or something. And within a sect, there's a kind of a refusal to engage the brain. It's blind faith. The leader says that I believe it and I don't question it. Whereas in the Catholic Church, there's a greater emphasis on the use of reason. So that might be one of the differences there. Okay? Yes, uh, Chris. What is the proper response to give to the Jehovah's when they come knock on It's evidently a Christian home. What's, what's the proper response when, when a Jehovah Witness comes knocking at your door? It, I think that's a good question. Um, we do not recognize, we would not recognize the, the, uh, the Jehovah Witnesses as an ecclesial community. See, because of the fact that they do not share the same creed. All the, the Protestant churches, we share the same creed. You know, when we say the creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son. All the Protestant churches share that same creed with us. Um, but the, the Jehovah Witnesses do not believe that, well, they believe that Jesus Christ is the incarnation of the Word of God, the Logos, but they do not believe that the Logos is truly God. They, 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 they don't have an understanding of the Trinity as we have. We believe the Trinity is Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons in one God. They have an idea that there's God the Father, and then God the Father created a kind of a half-God, a semi-God, who is the Logos. And it's that semi-God that was incarnate in Jesus. And, that, and the Spirit of God isn't truly a, a person of God. It's just God's presence. So their understanding of the Trinity and of the being of Jesus is different from that of the Christian churches. So that's why there is no um, ecumenical dialogue with the Jehovah Witnesses. They're, they're, they're not considered an ecclesial community, all right? They're considered a completely different religion. Though they quote the Bible, they're another religion because their understanding of God and of Jesus is so dis different from ours. And, and so the welcome you should give them would be like the welcome you would give to a Muslim, wh which would be, uh, we can dialogue, but you have to understand we don't share the same faith. We, we don't even recognize Jesus the same way. You know, you, you might walk around with the Bible, but you read the Bible as if it was another religion. All right, so so I would say you receive them with politeness, uh, as we are called to be polite with everyone, and with care and with love. I would not argue with with them, because th th it's impossible to argue with them. You know, um, I would uh, give a witness to your own faith. You know, um, and then say thank you and have a good day. That's that's kind of what I would do. You know. Yes. Chip, I'm just wondering about the quotations in the Hippie Candidate. Is this from Lumen Gentium or is it from the congregation's response? Generally, when they're quoting, this, what I've given you is the congregation's response. This, this is the text that was published this summer. This is the whole text. So most of the time, the congregation in its response is quoting from Lumen Gentium. Okay? So, yeah. But this is the full, those are the five responses. With the response, there's also a letter. Um, uh, Cardinal Levada, he published a letter which introduces this and gives a few comments on it. You can find it on the Vatican's website. If you go to the Vatican's website, have you ever been on the Vatican's website? If you go to the website and you click, there's, there's a series of images. One of the images for the Curia. You click on the Curia, it, you'll have congregations, councils, tribunals. Uh, so you go to academies, you go, you click on congregations and it'll give you the dozen congregations, the ministries, like I was saying, the departments. So you go congregation for the doctrine of the faith. You click on that and underneath it, you'll find doctrinal documents, disciplinary documents. Uh, for example, a disciplinary document was the document that they put out um, excommunicating the army of Mary just a, a month ago, you know? That's a disciplinary document. But you go under doctrinal documents, if you click on that, you'll find this, this response and you will find the commentary that goes with it. Okay? Yes? I understand what 
you said about the churches. Mm -hmm. It's very hard for me to be confronted by other faiths. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I have to say that even with the Jehovah, the witnesses very, very kind probably, but they do insist to come into the house. Yeah. And I, I am very polite. I insist I am a good Catholic, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I go, I lose patience and say, go and peddle your faith. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 what you have to admire about groups like the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons is their missionary zeal, you know. Now, I, that's not my understanding of what evangelization is, and uh, that's not the way I would encourage uh, uh, Catholics to evangelize. There was a beautiful project last uh, summer that was done by the Legionaries of Christ in the parish of um, uh, Glen Walter. Um, what they did during Holy Week is they, they went and knocked on each door. You know, all the novices, they went out and knocked on each door, asking people, this is Holy Week in the Catholic Church, and we're going to be praying. Do you have an intention you want us to pray for? And that's what they said. Do you want us to pray for someone or for something? And uh, we'll write it down, and thank you very much. And here's a schedule of the celebrations at the church, if you're interested. Have a good day. Bye. You know? And I think that was a beautiful way of reaching out to people, to the young church and everything. And it's remarkable. They told me how many people said, well, thank you, you know, like, yes, would you pray for my sister? Would you pray for my brother? Would you pray for peace on earth, you know? And, and so some people told them, get out, you know, and I don't want to, you know, so they saw them as traveling salesmen. But, but I think that approach was a beautiful approach. And I think that's how you evangelize, by telling people you care for them and reaching out to them that way. So I think you're right, you know, when, when, when you feel you don't have the, 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 the tools to talk with them and uh, you say, thank you, I'm not interested, have a good day, you know, and I think that's the best way to do it. Yes? <coughs> the, church, the churches there, there was an article that appeared in a newspaper from the document that you Yes. Well, I'll repeat it here. Pope Benedict has reasserted the universal primacy of the Roman Catholic Church, approving a document released Tuesday that says Orthodox churches are defective and that other Christian denominations are not true churches. Yes. And that's, I mean, this is the problem with newspapers. The language in this document is very technical. It's, it's a theological document. So that when we hear the word defective, you know, you go, that's awful, you know. But, but in technical language, what it says is that there is an element missing among all the elements of salvation, you know. If it was a pastoral document, it wouldn't have used that language. One of the problems with Rome is that sometimes they don't realize how language is going to be understood by the common ordinary people. And, and so some of that language is hurtful language when it's just put out that way. And, and, and that's unfortunate because that's not the intention of the authors of the document. But the authors are, 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 are writing for a kind of a narrow theological audience. And the press gets it and they just splatter a lot over it. And so, you know, and, and, and so I, I saw an article in the newspaper saying, Pope says everybody else is, all non-Catholics are going to hell. That's not at all what the document said. It goes against what the document is saying. But, you know, you, unfortunately you can't count on the secular media to explain the teaching of the church in, in a clear way. And, and and that's true not just for the Catholic Church. It's true for all religions. I, I, I think they do not present Islam correctly. You know, and one of the big problems right now is that our, our image of the Muslims is being shaped by a secular press that really doesn't try to understand what Islam is about. And so it's, it's, it's important to, to kind of, if you want to understand Islam, go, go speak with the Muslims. You know, go talk with them. Ask them how they live their religion, what it means for them. Don't stick with what you read in the papers. Any questions on this side? I've been taking them all from this side here. Oui. With the excommunication of the army of Mary... Does that mean that now we don't believe in any of the elements that was similar? Well, well you know, like, like let's say you take the Army of Mary as a group. If it continues, you know, for a long, long time, then we will consider that it is a group. Uh, 
right now, the, the sacraments that are celebrated by the priests of the Army of Mary who are ordained by bishops of the Catholic Church are considered to be true sacraments, all right? The mass, the masses that they celebrate, we do not recognize those as valid. So, what does that mean down the road? It probably means that, let's say, you know, they go on for another fifty years, and all the priests who are ordained by bishops, you know, uh, have all passed on, and and their priests are all people who were ordained by their own members. We won't consider those to be valid sacraments anymore. So they'll be. We will look at them a bit like we look at. Um, we will evaluate them like. A, an evangelical church they're they're well no it's true now their teachings their teachings have moved away yeah it's more like the jehovah witnesses their teachings have moved so far away from the creed of the catholic church though they don't recognize that and they deny it but they have they have this one leader in many well yes yes that that's right they have that one leader and but more than that they now claim that there's god but next to god there's a feminine god there's a goddess they don't call her that they call it the Immaculate Principle, but is co-eternal to God, and that Immaculate Goddess was incarnate in Mary the Nazareth and is now incarnate in Mary Pajga. So their whole understanding of God now is no longer compatible with the Catholic Church's That's understanding. The ones that were ordained, like the ones we had in our diocese. Yes, those who were ordained who were working in our diocese are still priests, they're still recognized as priests, and the sacraments are valid, but they do not have the right to celebrate them. And, and, uh, and celebrate Mass. They're, they don't have the right to celebrate Mass, but if they break that law, we still recognize the sacrament as valid because they were validly ordained. You know, so that's how it is with the Army of Mary. One final question on this document before we break. Has this been enlightening for you? Yes. Has it been, been worthwhile? Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's not an easy topic, yeah? It's not an easy topic, but I thought it was an important topic to try to tackle. And, and even for me, because I usually don't teach in ecclesiology, it's not my area of specialty, but I, it was good because it forced me to read a, a lot. And uh, I went back and read some old articles of Cardinal Ratzinger when he was Cardinal Ratzinger on this issue, so I found it very interesting. So thank you very much. Just to let you know, in November, I will be giving a talk in English and en français also, but in November, I will be, it will be an evening on the uh, Eucharistic Congress, the International Eucharistic Congress in Quebec City. I will be, I'll be introducing, explaining what an International Eucharistic Congress is, uh, the history of Congresses. We'll have um, a DVD to show you, and we'll be able to give information for anybody who wants to go. So in November on the uh, Eucharistic, International Eucharistic Congress. Okay? Have a good night. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>